and welcome to Virtual Worship with First Evangelical Lutheran Church in Poughkeepsie, New York. Today is November 22nd, Christ to the King Sunday, and our last Sunday before we begin Advent. I'm Lisa, one of the worship leaders here at First. Again, welcome to everybody. As a reminder, for Advent season, anybody who will be worshiping with you, we invite you to gather together some candles. They can be any color, although the traditional candles color for Advent is blue or purple, and to light those candles with us as we worship during Advent. Today we do have a special guest speaker, Reverend Becca Seeley, and we are so pleased that she could join us. So again, welcome to virtual worship, and we'll now continue with our order for confession and forgiveness. Holy One, we confess that we are not awake for you. We are not faithful in using your gifts. We forget the least of our siblings. We do not see your beautiful image in one another. We are infected by sin that divides your beloved community. Open our hearts to your coming. Open our eyes to see you in our neighbor. Open our hands to serve your creation. Amen. Beloved, we are God's children, and Jesus, our beloved, opens the door to us. Through Jesus, we are forgiven. By Jesus, we are welcome. In Jesus, we are called to rejoice. Let us live in the promises prepared for us from the foundation of the world. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, 
You have knit your people together in one communion in the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Grant us grace to follow your blessed saints in lives of faith and commitment and to know the inexpressible joys you have prepared for those who love you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first lesson comes from the 34th chapter of Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been, scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries, and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the watercourses, and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you have pushed with flank and shoulder, and butted at all the weak animals with your horns, until you scattered them far and wide. I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be ravaged, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Here ends the first reading. We will now read responsively from Psalm 95. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before God's presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to the Lord with psalms. For you, Lord, are a great God and a great ruler above all gods. In your hand are the caverns of the earth. The heights of the hills are also yours. The sea is yours, for you have made it, and your hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For the Lord is our God, and we are the people of God's pasture and the sheep of God's hand. The second lesson comes from the first chapter of Ephesians. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, and for this reason I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Here ends the second reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the ghost at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you are blessed by my father. 
inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that I saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of those who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left hand, You are accursed. Depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devils and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that I saw you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. It's so wonderful to be here sharing the Word of God with you at First Lutheran this morning. Thank you for inviting me. Well, I'm sorry we can't all be together in person this morning. It is so very good to be with you nonetheless, and I'm grateful for the technology that makes it possible. My name is Becca Seely, and I am the director of an organization called Lutheran Ministries in Higher Education. This is a campus ministry organization, and we work with college and graduate students at colleges across New York City. 
We have a network of campus ministries uh, it's called The Vine NYC, and we have branches of students meeting locally in Manhattan and in Queens. This year, we are serving students from about eight or nine different colleges. Uh, in any given year, sometimes we have students from up to 12 or 13 colleges in New York City who participate in our ministries. So during a normal year, we gather students in these branches for weekly meals and Bible studies, for conversation and communion, for retreats and learning trips. We've, we've done a civil rights pilgrimage, a, a trip to the U.S.-Mexico border, and we also do service and justice work together throughout the year. Through campus ministry, students find communities where they can be loved for exactly who they are and where they can explore their relationship with God and try to figure out in a supportive environment who it is that God is calling them to become during a transitional and critical moment in their lives. This year, not a normal year, as you might imagine, we are still finding ways to provide that kind of support and connection and spiritual nurture for students, mostly through a computer screen. Since this semester, our students are spread out across the country and the world from New York City to Northern California, all the way to New Zealand. Try figuring out those time zones. It's truly boggling. While so much is different for us this year though, for all of us really, I continue to find so much joy and hope in these resilient young people that I serve. They are so passionate and curious and faithful and funny and full of life. And even though I'm sick of the screen, as I'm sure many of us are, I continue to rejoice in this ministry that I've been called to do. And I will tell you, my friends, I'll let you in on a secret. One of the greatest joys of all in working with college and graduate students is that they, whether remote or in person in the city, generally speaking, do not get up before noon on Sundays. Which means, not that I ever sleep in, oh no, no, but that I have the opportunity to experience diverse, wonderful Sunday morning worship at congregations all across our synod. This is my first time at First Lutheran, and I am so delighted to be able to be with you on this Sunday where we celebrate the feast of Christ the King. Now, Christ the King Sunday comes around every year on the Sunday before Advent begins. And I don't know if this is true at First Lutheran, but in a lot of congregations, especially good mainline Protestant congregations, people don't really love the idea of Christ the King very much. We like Jesus as our friend, or a shepherd, or maybe a table-turning activist, or a radically welcoming dinner party host. But we're a little uncomfortable with the idea of Jesus as a king. It makes him sound so, I don't know, authoritarian. Many of us, and I'll admit myself included, would much rather imagine the reign Jesus ushers in as a kind of utopian commune than to imagine it as a medieval kingdom, complete with king and court, vassals and serfs, as we saw today, sheep and goats. Fair enough. After all, if you have taken fourth grade social studies in an American elementary school, you will have learned that we Americans have a democracy. Kings schmings, right? We cast off an oppressive monarchical power over us to claim the power of self-determination. And yet, this year feels different to me. This year, in this year of turmoil and suffering, as much as I want the restoration of our beautiful democracy, I also can't help but find myself longing not for the Jesus who gives me a puzzling parable to ponder, but for a good and powerful Christ the King who will ride in triumphantly and save us from the enormous, scary, seemingly endless mess we have gotten ourselves in. I imagine that this is, in some sense, not unlike how the disciples and the earlier followers of Jesus felt. Living under Roman rule, overtaxed, under-resourced, religiously oppressed, with social and political pressure building up around them to a boiling point, they, too, longed for a Messiah who would put things right and mete out justice for God's beleaguered people. This vision of the good sheep 
being sorted out from the bad goats that we see in our gospel reading today in Matthew. It's perhaps a reflection of that desire, right? That yearning for someone to come and put justice into place, to reward goodness and punish evil in a community where too many people found themselves ending up as the ones who the folks in power left hungry and thirsty, left exposed, left estranged, locked up and imprisoned and alone. Yes, this image that we get in Matthew today of the nations, of all the people gazing up awestruck at the royal Christ and receiving his righteous judgment showcases that human yearning for a powerful presence to arrive and set things right in our world. And Jesus responds to this yearning, to this desire, to this expectation of who he is by flipping it on its head, by turning it upside down. It's very on theme for Jesus whether he's wearing a, you know, a shiny crown surrounded by angels or walking barefoot around Galilee, throughout the Gospels, people who come to Jesus thinking they know what answer they are looking for, well, they're usually quick to discover that they weren't even asking the right question. Think of the rich young man who we see in multiple Gospels. He yearns to inherit eternal life and learns to his great surprise and dismay that he will only find it by giving his inheritance away. We see this flipping of expectations in today's reading too. The people, they're gathered around the Messiah in all of his glory. They're gazing up in wonder to finally see his beatific face. And he surprises them by saying, um, actually, we've met. What? Neither the morally good sheep or the selfish and oblivious goats, or the ones like us who are a little bit of both. Well, nobody saw that coming. They are surprised to learn that while they were looking up to the sky for God to descend, he was among them all along. Not transcendent and glimmering, but incarnate, fully present in our world. His eyes looking out at us through the eyes of the ones who hunger and thirst, the ones who are cast out and lonely, the ones who are sick and locked away. The crowds in Matthew are surprised and disoriented to discover that they were looking for God in all the wrong places. And though many of us have heard this gospel passage before, I think that if we really internalized what Jesus is saying here, If we treated it not as a moralistic illustration about how we should behave, but as a sacramental truth, many of us would probably find ourselves surprised and disoriented too. The guy asking for a dollar on the street whom I walked right by yesterday while I was looking at my phone, well, he was the son of God? When I talked on the phone to my lonely grandma who is in this lockdown nursing home about how to fix the volume on her TV again, I was talking to Jesus? If we are worrying about God's judgment, this is a very scary thought. How often, after all, all of us have ignored, forgotten, dismissed, even judged others. And yet, when we trust in the God of grace and of mercy, this passage becomes this incredible invitation, this chance to know Jesus more fully and deeply and truly every single day. Sometimes, even often, this invitation to meet and know Jesus comes to us in unexpected ways and in unexpected places. For instance, before I served as a campus pastor, I probably would have assumed that most college students had the same privileged experience that I did in college living on campus in a dorm, eating on a meal plan, using whatever extra money I had to buy overpriced coffee and cheap beer. What I've discovered, however, is that many, many college students in New York City, probably in Poughkeepsie, and all across the country struggle mightily with affording their studies, and that a big part of that struggle manifests in food insecurity. Some recent studies have shown that something like 20% of students at NYU here in Manhattan report regularly having trouble affording food. And nearly 50%, nearly half of students at the City University of New York reported being food insecure for at least part of each month. I know this not just from studies I've read, 
I work with students who count on taking home the leftovers from our ministry meals, especially during exam times, when they have to cut back their hours at work during finals to the extent that they can't afford food and studying. And so as the pandemic has shifted our regular campus ministries, has taken much that we do online, it's also opened up this opportunity for us to go beyond feeding students around the table inside our campus ministries and helped us to reach out to all students in our community who hunger. This fall, we partnered with the feeding ministry at Trinity Lower East Side, a local ELCA congregation, to launch a new college student food pantry in Manhattan's East Village. Twice a month, we're able to provide three days worth of free groceries to any college or grad student who needs food. No questions asked. The pantry has been open a total of eight hours this semester, two hours twice a month. And in that time, we've been able to provide 130 bags of groceries to students from 12 different colleges and universities. It just floors me, those numbers themselves, but it, but it, it floors me even more to think that in each one of these struggling, resilient students who shows up to get groceries on a Wednesday afternoon, Jesus Christ is fully present even in, maybe most especially in, the students who to the eyes of the world seem least like Jesus would be in them. The self-proclaimed intellectual atheists and the students who are very suspicious of church, the, the queer students, the ones covered in tattoos and piercings, the students requesting kosher and halal meals and groceries. But most flooring of all, uh, perhaps at least to me, is the fact that it is students who are making all of this happen. Students run the pantry each time it's open. Students enthusiastically share information about this pantry with their friends and on social media, just in case somebody out there needs it. Students sign up to volunteer. Students make unsolicited donations of food and of money. I might look from one perspective, right, at the great masses of New York City college kids just walking around the village and see in them the coming death of the church as we've known it, because they sleep late on Sundays, because they don't trust big institutions. And yet, I look again at these same students feeding one another and in their deep need and in their free giving to one another, I glimpse the body of Christ connected in mutual vulnerability and in love. How has this difficult year revealed opportunities for the community here at First Lutheran to glimpse Jesus anew, perhaps in those you wouldn't have expected, perhaps in each other, perhaps even in yourself? What invitations into mercy and service into vulnerability, into unexpected and sacred relationship has God offered up right here in Poughkeepsie in the midst of disruption and of loss. Martin Luther preached and taught about what he called the theology of the cross, which basically means that the places where we will be sure to meet God are the last places we would think to look. If we look for God in what the world calls glorious, wealth and power, prestige, popularity, influence, we're going to come up empty. But if we look for God on the cross, both the literal cross and in the despised and suffering places and people of this world, well, then we will surely encounter the revelation of God in true glory. So perhaps in this endless election season. Can you believe that we're still in the election season somehow? But perhaps in this season of, of Twitter reloading and news channel binging for word of who's going to claim power and what they'll do with it, our invitation on this Christ the King Sunday is to look for the power and glory and presence of God who has already saved us in the places Jesus has told us that that power and glory and presence will be in our neighbors in need, in the forgotten ones and the desperate ones, and even the ones we are pretty sure would end up as goats. And in our own deep need too, laid bare by forces beyond our control, in the vulnerability and mercy and self-giving and tenderness through which God is transforming our world even now, in and through us, humble citizens though we may be of this kingdom of God. 
Next week, we begin the season of Advent. This is a time when we wait with hearts full of longing for Jesus to come into our world again and illuminate the shadows of our lives. For many of us, it will also be a season of deep longing for those we love whom we can't see, for traditions we have to put on hold this year. And yet, if Jesus in today's gospel has anything to tell us as we enter into this Advent season, it is that we will recognize his coming once more into our world in these days, not by the light of angelic halos and glittering crowns, or even of twinkly lights or crackling fires, but by the light of his love unending as it passes between us in our need and our giving and in our weakness and in our mercy. At this hinge point of a new church year, may we remember, Christ is already King of Kings for eternity. Christ is coming here and now in this mess that is 2020, in flesh, in suffering, in our neighbors, in us. So God, help us to pull our eyes up from our phones and down from the skies and to recognize him right here in our midst to recognize you, God, among us. Amen. Let us pray together our affirmation of faith. This is the creed from the Moravian Church. We believe in the one God who has created the land and sea and heavens and all that is in them, who established a world that is good who gives to us the task of watchful and responsible care over it, who is certainty and truth. We believe in the one God who in Jesus Christ assumed our humanity and knew our life as a child, youth, and adult, who dined with sinners and lived with the homeless, who confronted popular opinion and power, who remained obedient in temptation and suffering, whose triumph was a servant's death and resurrection. We believe in the one God who comes to us as comforter and advocate, who does not leave us orphans, who brings peace and calms the troubled heart, who bestows gifts for serving, healing, showing compassion and doing miracles who alone is the power and the wisdom of our proclamation. Amen. Prayers of Intercession Longing for Christ's reign to come among us, we pray for the outpouring of God's power on the church, the world, and all in need. Sovereign of all, train our ears to hear your cry in the needs of those around us, Bless all social ministries of the church through which we seek to serve others as we ourselves have been served. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You cause rain to fall on the just and unjust alike. Direct our use of creation to provide for the needs of all people in ways that are sustainable for the earth. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Bring peace to every place where conflict rages. Grant opportunities for ending divisions among us and usher in your reign of unity and reconciliation. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Heal the sinful divisions we erect between us and release us from systems of oppression and prejudice. Restore our capacity to see your image in those whose dignity we have stripped away. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Pour out the gifts of your spirit on children and youth throughout the church. Sustain those who work in children's ministry, youth ministry, and campus ministry as they nurture the gifts of young people. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We continue to pray for Renata and for Judy. We pray for Kevin's sister, Mary, and for Ricky's sister, Renata. We also pray for Kurt's mother, Lisa's mother, 
Barbara's mother, for Alice and Hans. Be with Sherry in her healing and Jean as she recovers from a broken hip. Our prayers remain with all those among our immediate and extended church families who serve in medical settings. Nancy, Donna, Erica, Henry, Ryan, and Terry and Chaplain Kelly Ray at Lutheran Care. We pray for the Trevady family in India, for Linda's friend Sally, for Anne's niece and for her brothers, for Sally's mother Brantley, for Maureen and Frank, Taryn and Chris, and Tom and Phil. We pray also for Ricky's other sister and for Scott's sister. We continue to pray for Eddie, Richard and David, and Dale and Dave, each according to their needs. We remember in our prayers today Erna and Michael, Tansu, Eunice, Louise, Jean, Alice, Mary, Adele's friend Anne, and Linda's cousin Sandy. We pray for Colin as he deploys overseas and for his family as they support him long distance. For all members of our military together with their families and loved ones, and for the chaplains who minister to them, including Lisa's husband, Anthony. And we pray for our Bishop Paul, assistant to the Bishop Chris, and for our presiding Bishop Elizabeth, for St. John's Lutheran and for the Lutheran Care Center, Dutchess County Interfaith Council, our ecumenical partners, including the World Council of Churches and for the Church Universal. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In the ecumenical prayer cycle for today, our sisters and brothers in Christ in Brunei, Malaysia, and Singapore have asked us to join them in praying for more just participatory and democratic rule, locally determined economic development that lessens inequalities and protects natural resources greater ethnic and religious understanding and cooperation, the forging of national identities and visions that genuinely include all the diverse people in these countries. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Thank you for saints now departed, who fed the hungry, clothed the naked, and tended to the sick. Inspire us by their example that we may see your presence in those in need around us. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Receive our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, until that day when you gather all creation around your throne, where you will reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And now please share that peace with all those you are with. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hear the blessing. May the God of all creation, in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved, who strengthens us for service, give you reason to rejoice and be glad. The blessing of God, sovereign Savior and Spirit, be with us today and always. Amen.
beloved of God, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.